two writers, one just starting out, the other a bestseller. Join James Blatch and Mark Dawson and their amazing guests as they discuss how you can make a living telling stories. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome to the Self-Publishing Formula Podcast with James and Mark on a Friday in June. And uh, if we're looking slightly more drawn and tired than normal, uh, if you're watching on YouTube or sounding slightly more laggy, uh, that's because we have cranked open the doors to Ads for Authors, which is always a busy time for us getting the course ready. We've added a session on GDPR, which uh, is uh, without question the most exciting and enthralling session in the whole Advertising for Authors course. I couldn't stop watching it. Yeah, although I noticed you did stop watching it. I watched 70% of it, and then I decided that it was in safe hands. Seeing as, that, seeing as I'd seen it before. So yes, yes, yes very indeed. Important to get that right. Um, so, yes, all the sort of privacy policies and cookie policies, everything that's all bound into advertising for authors course now. And if you don't know about it, because we do occasionally mention the course, it's uh, the driver for the SPF community. Um, it is the all encompassing, all singing, dancing uh, course to really add rocket fuel to your career and, and create a commercial business out of your writing. And that's what it's done time and time again. We have delighted authors around the world uh, who speak to us on camera about that. And, um, it is without question a very pleasing aspect of uh, of what we do. Yes, it's the best. It's the best bit when um, we get an email from someone saying that they've suddenly their kind of the penny has dropped and um, they're they're suddenly making decent money or sometimes much more than decent money. And then we we get the green light to send James and John to all points of the compass to to record testimonials. Yeah, so we, we're looking forward to that. I think we're doing some more in America soon, aren't we? We are. We're going to be doing that in New York in July. And we've got um, out on the East Coast and Minneapolis, I think. And we've got a few uh, new ones this time. So Sasha Black uh, in the UK, Daniel Parsons, Dan Parsons in the UK, both been talking about the impact that Ads for Authors has made on their writing career. Uh, I got a note the other day from one of our very early students who we've mentioned occasionally before and had on the podcast, Ernest Dempsey, um, who mm. first of all bought a house and has just bought his dream car. And every time he does something like this, he sends a little note to you and me to say, I know I've said this before, but I want to thank you for doing that course because it changed everything for me. And he's also sent me some very exciting news. But which I'm not, you can't say. Which I can't say, and I'm not going to say any more about. But uh, uh, you will be the first to know when there's an opportunity to talk publicly about it. So that's a great success story from the course. Um, yeah, I should say, if you want to check out uh, what's in the course, the meat of it all, you can go to the uh, sales page. The URL is selfpublishingformula.com forward slash ads for authors. And we're old school, so the four is spelt F-O-R. It says, ads for authors, A-D-S-F-O-R-A-U-T-H-O-R-S. And the uh, the S at the end is actually a Z. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's awesome. really, I hate that. I, I do know what, I hate, I hate the Z, but um, I am thinking I might just say to John Dyer, just do the ads for authors with the four in it as well, just in case. People are younger. There are some people younger than us in the uh, SPF community. It's hard to believe, but yes, it's, it is true. I'm 21. You are 21. You've had a really hard um, life. I have. Oh. <laughs> very, very hard. I had a strange noise then, despite the fact that my computer's on um, uh, Do Not Disturb. Something just disturbed us. I don't know what it was. Anyway, ho <laughs> hopefully it wasn't too alarming for anybody. Good. Okay, look, we have uh, a few people to welcome to the Patreon family, the supporters of the uh, podcast, and we're very, very grateful all the time for people who join us. Uh, they are Jamie Ferguson, who's joined our gold level at uh, uh, patreon.com forward slash SPF podcast. Uh, he's from Colorado in the United States. Elaine Bateman from Solihull in the United Kingdom. Anne Cameron uh, from Nova Scotia uh, in Canada. And Mark O'Neill from The Mark O'Neill Show. Gold Patreon for us from Bayern in Germany. Uh, what a, a, a good spread, geographic spread that is. And uh, thank you very much, Jamie, uh, Elaine, Anne and Mark. Delighted for you to join us. And because they are all signed up to the gold level, which I think is a whopping $3 uh, an episode of the podcast, uh, they are all eligible to be handpicked for our next book lab guest. And I can tell you the current uh, pick is Helena Harm. And I have recorded the um, interview with Brian Cohen. I've recorded the interview with Jenny Parrott. I'm yet to do Stuart. I'll probably do Stuart this week. And then that episode will be ready uh, to broadcast in the next few weeks. And it's a really good one, particularly so far, I would say from Brian Cohen's point of view. He really 
uh, got into this. And it, uh, we deliberately chose a different genre from last time. So it's romance. And uh, Brian's eyes lit up about this. He's done a fantastic job with the blurb and talks very effusively about this. I mean, it started with a, a little spoiler. He really liked what Helena had done. And I think Helena... There was definitely a whiff of Brian Cohen about her blurb. I think she picked up um, his sort of uh, advice on how to put a blurb together, but he felt that as a challenge for him and his team to elevate it uh, to the next level. So it's a really good episode and some really good learning points in that for all of us. So that episode's coming up. We'll let you know when uh, nearer the time. Uh, just uh, one more thing on the course. We're going to keep it open roughly for three weeks. Uh, we have closed it early before. It's possible if it fills up, we get too many people, we'll close it early uh, this time, but uh, roughly around the 25th, 27th, around there. Okay, good. We've got an interview today with a, uh, a man in uh, the later years of his life. He's actually even older than you. And you. And me. I am older than you. You're much older than me. I'm not going to say much is a strong word. I am older six, than you. Six years. It's a long time. Is it six years? So you're <laughs> the same age as my wife. So there you go. There you go. <laughs> we bumped into David Penny at the uh, London Book Fair, and I think you've been in contact with David for some time, Mark. You know you know him for a while? A little while, yeah. David's involved with Ally. Um, so we've spoken before, and I think he was one of the one of the first to sign up, maybe the second time we, we offered ads. And um, because David is involved with Ally, it's, it was really pleasing that he got such a, such a great amount out of the course and, and has become a, a fairly vocal proponent of it, which is, is, is great given that you know, people look to Ally for trusted services and, and things like that. So we were, we were really pleased that he's done so well and, and also not in, not in the kind of the most straightforward of genres. So he's not writing thrillers like me. He's not writing romances uh, with those big voracious audiences. He's he's writing historical um, historical fiction, really. So you know, obviously a, a decent sized niche, but not as big as as the ones that I traffic in, for example. So it was really pleasing when I saw his early posts about how he was doing so well. He's posting in our Facebook group um, and and making good money uh, out of it. So. Um, it was nice to meet him in the pub, and he's also lovely. Um, he's yeah. a really affable, friendly bloke um, that I, I immediately warmed to. I think you know you're, you're the same, James. And it was really, really great to to get him uh, on the on the podcast to talk about his experiences. Yeah, definitely a really lovely guy. A little twinkle in his eye as well. And one of the most pleasing aspects of this is that David has found, uh, and later in life, once you've retired from your main job, you're relying on your pension. Um, and there's not much beyond that, particularly in the US, where I don't think uh, you know, the state helps out a huge amount uh, later in life. And to have suddenly a growth in the income from something that you've loved doing all your life is a really pleasing story. So uh, let's hear from David. Well, we're back at the London Book Fair, as uh, described. In fact, we're in front of an area that is reserved for what they're calling rights management discussions. David Penny, my guest, we won't discuss. Well, we could discuss the rights and wrongs of things, <laughs> but not the legal. No, rights. no, I, I, think, I think for indies, rights are a bit of a minefield and you yeah. want to be very careful about them. Well, we've stolen a couple of their chairs. Any reason I mention it? Great, they, great. In, in the middle of this, <laughs> they may come with a contract <laughs> uh, to us. Good. David Penny, welcome to the Self Publishing Thank you very podcast. much, James. Thank it's you. It's a light to have you here. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about you. I guess we'll talk about Ally as well, because I know you're involved yeah, in Ally. Sure, and, yeah, sure. Um, but let's start with you. Why don't you describe uh, to us who you are, a bit about your writing. Okay, uh, so I'm David Penny. I managed to fall into writing at an extremely young age. At 23, I acquired an agent and a publisher and wrote science fiction exclusively. I had um, four books out between 1974 and 1979. Made the grand sum of 200 pounds on each one. And in 1979 or 1980, I got married and decided I couldn't afford to yeah. live. Because um, even in 1979, £200 is not going to change. I, I, I was a hippie. I had hair down my waist and a great long beard. Um, and £200 went a long way. You know, okay. Drugs were cheap in those days. Yes. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Well, money well spent. It was, yeah, yeah. The rest I wasted. Yeah. Um, George Best. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> Too good not to use. Yeah. Um, and then I gave up writing for 35 plus years got a job, ended up running a software company, and then probably 10 years ago, I thought, I, 
my ambition when I was young was always to be a writer. I was a writer and I'm not anymore. And as time goes on, I'm running out of time to get back to doing what is my first love. So I started to write again, lots of bits and pieces that never saw the light of day. And then about five years ago, I got this idea for a 10 book series, historical mystery now rather than science fiction, set in Moorish Spain, 1482 to 1492. Really, you know, if that, you're going to have a niche, yes. pick, pick one nobody uh, else has ever done. We're going to talk a little bit about, um, <laughs> about niches, and that is uh, yeah. specific. It is fairly specific, yeah. Uh, and I've no idea where it came from. Okay. We were sitting at home, me, Meg, the two kids, because uh, they were still at home then. And I said, you know, nobody's ever written a detective mystery novel set in Moorish Spain, have they? And they said, duh, Dad. That, that was a random question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> yeah. And I've, I had no idea where it came from. I must have seen something on the TV or read a book or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, and I knew nothing about the period in history. So lots of research required. Lots of going to libraries where they give you a pair of white gloves oh, uh, yes. and a thing like a pair of rose. I don't know if you've done this, rosary beads and you lay it on the books oh. and you lay these huge like 16th century tomes open. Wow. And I made copious notes, went away and out of interest I typed into Amazon the title of one of these um, books and they said, yeah, do you want a facsimile copy? Oh. So you can get all of this stuff. It's all been copied. That, that is, it's all been, been digitized. So you don't need the white gloves and the rosary You don't? Bits. No, no, you don't. Except, yeah, they're Amazon books, so the ink comes off on your fingers. Yes, okay. Yeah. Um, the, if my maths is correct, it makes you mid-60s? Uh, yeah, and a bit. And a bit, a little bit, and okay. A bit, so, little bit over. Um, so what a fantastic kind of renaissance of writing yeah. for you. And also, I think, from an income point of view, and I'm of an age, a little bit younger than you, where the whole pension thing is a big issue for us, is it, yeah. as it is in the States, yeah. thinking about income. Yeah. And I, yeah. I fully intend to be working in my 60s and yeah. 70s, I want to be. Yeah. And so I look at you and I think that's, that's a pretty good setup to discover something you're passionate about. Yeah. And you told me off air, I hope you, you'd be happy to share a little bit on air, that it's, it's paying more than paying bills. It is, yeah. I, I, I'm, 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 I'm like Joanna Penn, I'm perfectly happy to tell people exactly how much I earn. So. Three, year, three, four years ago. Well, I started doing Mark's course, yep. Mark Dawson's course, I think just a bit over three years ago, it might have been earlier. And I was earning, on a good year, I would get 800,000 pounds a year. 800,000? 800 pounds a year. <laughs> Just no, to no. correct that. Just, yeah. Did 800, I say 800,000? 800, 800, Sorry. 000. Then you did <laughs> yeah. the course. Yeah. So <laughs> no. now it's, it's gone up quite a bit. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. So 800, 800 pounds, a pounds a year. Okay. So yeah, pin, as, pin money, really. Yeah. You know, I was one of these authors where... Although you beat uh, your traditional deal. I did. Yeah, yeah, I did. Significant. You know, you know, it's like you see people and they say, oh yeah, I didn't sell anything for three days this week. Yeah. And you think, yeah, I've been there. It's exactly, you know, and you're looking at your sales every day and thinking, oh my God, I, you know. Oh, I sold two books, I sold two books. <laughs> so I kind of, that I've always had this belief that what I write is really good. I think if you're a writer, you have to do that. You have to think that you're, you know, you're writing the best thing. But basically I write what I want to read and I can't find it. And so I, I'm writing what I would love to read. And so I'm my best audience. And then there must be other people like me. That's what you think. How am I going to close that gap between what I've written and the hundreds, the thousands, the tens, the hundreds of thousands of people that are out there in the world that also want to read that kind of thing? And it's a really difficult thing to close up because social media encourages us to talk to other people like ourselves. Yeah. And as a writer... The famous echo chamber. Exactly. As a writer, almost all of my social media friends were other authors. And it's a very insular existence. And so you're, you're talking to people and they're saying, oh yeah, it's hard, you know, Amazon are doing this and that and, and something's gone wrong and no oh, sales are down and sales are up. But I wanted to get to people who were not writers, who were readers. Yeah. And the, I think when I took Mark's course, he, sa he, he said something along those lines. And so I, I thought, right, there's all this readership out there. How do I reach them? I did Mark's course. Um, and like I said, I think I started about two and a half, three years ago. And I'd made a little bit of money, you know, like a thousand a, a year for three or four years and something. So I'd, I'd built, I called it my slush fund. My wife 
just so that my wife says, knows it's not hers. Yeah. Um, and I thought I'll invest some of that money in seeing if I can make Facebook adverts work. And I, I ignored going for mailing list signups. And I thought I'll try to sell books because I write books, I want to sell books. That's what I'll go for. And I put three months aside and came up with some ads and spent five, six hundred pounds a month on those ads. And at the end of that three months, my sales has gone up, but not by as much as I'd spent. Okay. So I'd lost three or four hundred pounds, but it was a learning curve and I was happy. The thing about doing Facebook ads is you don't do it unless you're happy. It's a gamble. Yeah, to lose the money. Yeah, if, if, you, if you are desperate to get the income and you're not willing to lose some, then you probably don't really want to jump in and spend a lot of money. Yeah. And Facebook are very avaricious. Yes. They, you know, They'll take your money, give me, yeah, Amazon, yeah. Amazon, you can throw money towards them and they just let it go for pass. But Amazon, I've, interestingly, I've noticed lately, Amazon take more than my budget. Yes. Pretty much every day. <laughs> AdWords do that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, it, not supposed to, but it seems to be the way. Um, so anyway, after three months, I'd, I'd made some mistakes and I tried to work out what I'd done. I took two months off from advertising and I sat down and I tried to think of, okay, that's wrong, that's wrong. And one of the things, and this is, I tell people when they ask me, one of the things Mark said is a yellow image works really well, mm -hmm. you know? So I said, okay, let's make it yellow. And ever since all my ads have been yellow or an orange hue, so I came up with an ad and it is really simple. It's an orange background with a castle on it. It's actually Edinburgh Castle. So, but, and somebody did point that out to right. me very unkindly. And it's got a guy, a silhouette of a guy on horseback. And that was it. And I put a few words on it and a strap line and pointed it to Amazon US and UK. And for some reason that worked. And it worked really well. So I went from earning thousand pounds in a good year to that first year earning seven or eight thousand pounds and then over three years i'm now on sixty thousand pounds and fantastic it, it i'm very very pleased with that yeah <laughs> and so it, you, you, you kind of go and talk to mark and some of the other people that i know and you think yeah mark's stratospheric you know he's doing unbelievably well uh and he's the kind of beacon that everybody's aiming for but what I think people need to remember is that there you can make a living a good living out of writing and nobody has really heard of you all that much yeah you know I'm selling 150 160 books a day on a good day and that's bringing in that income and that's all as I say that's all you have to sell there'll be people who are watching this and they're going oh my god he's selling over 100 books a day yeah. you know when I've, I've got my zero days but it's it's feasible by picking your market and writing books that people want and and grabbing the readers and bringing them in it's the readers there's this get you know invent the best mouse trap and nobody's going to beat a path to your door unless they know you've got it and, and it's what they want. So well, that's what you have to do. I think that's great, David. <laughs> really, really good advice um, and a reminder that we don't... I mean, looking at what Mark's publishing yeah. now in terms of his figures, in it, and we'll t I'll talk to him off air about this or, or when mm. we come back after the interview, but he must be heading for seven figures this year, looking yeah. at, looking yeah, at what yeah. he's doing per month. And Definitely, because he publishes how much he earns a month. Yes, and, you there know. you go. And yeah. So for, for those of us, I really hope in the next 12 months I will be published myself. Um, yeah. For those of us starting out, it's, it's, not, it's, not un, it's not a waste of time looking at what Mark's achieved. It's understanding where our ambitions are within yeah. that. And yeah. you know, for somebody who's approaching retirement age, God knows what retirement age is anymore, I don't mm. know. Probably eighty. Mm. Approaching retirement age, to suddenly have sixty thousand yeah. yeah. a year. I mean, that's an amazing. Mm. All your pension worries must be out the window. And that's that's yeah. not sixty thousand advance from a traditional publisher that then becomes yeah. five thousand a yeah. year after. That's yeah, a yeah. recurring yeah. annual revenue for you. Yeah. How pleased are you with that? I, I'm just amazed. You know, it, it wasn't. I had no ambition to do anything in particular. It's when you talk about retirement. It, the thing about being a writer is it's fantastic because. You don't have to retire. It's not like work. No. You know, you sit down at, at the keyboard and, and you just, you should love what you do. And I do love what I do. 
if you're writing as a, a, a means of obtaining money, it, it doesn't usually work. No, don't but, play with scared money. And the other quote, of course, is John Lennon's, you find a job you love and you'll never work a day exactly, in your life. Exactly, exactly, yeah. yeah. And that's exactly what it's like, you know, it's fantastic. Good. Now let's yeah. talk a little bit about the genre. So, <laughs> pretty specific. <laughs> and I think when I think about it, I mean, it's fascinating. We Europeans holiday in that part of the world quite yeah. a lot. It's yeah. hot and sunny and Granada's beautiful city. In fact, I think John, who's standing behind the camera, and I have had romantic times filming corporate videos <laughs> that's, in I think Granada. that's more than I need to know. Yeah. <laughs> we always end up, we do these corporate video shoots around the world, right. and we end up having these romantic yeah. rooftop dinners. And yeah. I remember Granada specifically. Yeah. But it, the whole Moorish in, invasion, sort of sweep down, mm. it doesn't have the same cachet as the Roman time, does it? It doesn't. Reason, I don't, really I don't know, know why, why because, because the it, yeah. yeah. The, the Moors were in Spain for far longer than the Romans were in Europe. Wow. Yeah, it was 700 years. Dominant they, yeah, period. they came in in 771, and they were th they, their final redoubt of, of Granada fell in 1492. Okay. So that whole period. And this is off the back or during the, um, uh, what are they called, where, where the... Um, where the knights went over the and crusades. murdered them. The Crusades yeah, is the word the I'm crusades, grappling yeah. for here. Just fought, not murdered. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> fought them, yeah. <laughs> a different way of looking at it, but <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah. during that Crusades time, there was yeah. this migration of... There was, and, and the, the weird thing is, is that despite Spain being an Islamic country, up until about 1200, almost the whole of the Iberian Peninsula, including Portugal, was Islamic. And the Crusades went across to Jerusalem. They ignored Spain altogether. Right. Um, it was only as as the the Jerusalem Crusades died out that people started looking at. Oh yeah, oh, look, some, some look at all these. Left to fight yeah, over look there. at all these guys still in Spain in their in their hoods and their their cloaks and everything else. And so, English people and and, and French and Germans and, and Scandinavians went. And weirdly, a lot of more, uh, mercenaries fighting on the Moorish side were. Northern European. Oh, were they? Yeah. Well, the Moors, they were paid. The Moors well. reached a stage where they couldn't be bothered to do the fighting themselves. You know what it's like? Um, uh, civilizations evolve. And it, well, it's like, yeah, it's like if you own a business, you end up as a manager rather than a doer. Yeah. The Moors end up as the, as the leaders, and they just employed people to fight on their behalf, which is probably why eventually they lost. Yeah. But it, what, what I love about it is that last... 15, 10 or 15 years, the, the, the two, Isabel of Castile was the queen, married Ferdinand of Aragon. And if you mention Ferdinand and Isabel in Spain, they look at you blankly and they say, who? And then you say, the Catholic king and queen. And they say, oh, you mean Ferdinand and Isabel. Right. Okay. <laughs> Which is really weird. And that was the end of the period. That was the end. Yeah. But that fighting the Moor, expelling the Moorish invaders, the Reconquista, honed the Spanish troops to such an extent they were the best fighting force in the world. And then by luck, Columbus discovered the Americas from Spain, even though he was Italian. And so they went out and they, those trained troops then took over South America and, and you know, the west coast of America, Los, An Los Angeles right. and, and San Francisco, all, all of that west coast of America was Spanish. Wow. Yeah. yeah. All the way, you know, uh, just an amazing... Well, Spanish appears to be spoken as much out there as English when I'm, yeah, whenever yeah. I'm in that part yeah, of the yeah. world. Yeah, so. yeah, 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 yeah. I know. And it, it, it was that, that period of history, that short period I'm writing about, that honed the Spanish troops to do that and taught okay. them how to do it. And, and Isabel and Ferdinand died quite young. And Spain just fell apart after that. But it, so it's that really compact, really rich period that I wanted to write about. So great exciting period yeah. and untold large Very say, much untold, yeah. yeah. I mean there's some some books about it but not many. Yeah. Um, Washington Irving, you know, wrote about the, the Alhambra and uh, But the, it, da the danger of that is that there isn't an audience for it. But you had exactly, a hunch, you exactly. Had a, you had a hunch from the beginning? Or no, a, a I just wanted to write, I just wanted okay. to write it. Okay. Like I said, I'd been writing for two or three years at that point, and I'd written a book about a guy who could see 10 seconds into the future, mm. which is that's interesting concept. Well, I thought, well, concept, that's useless, right? except he was, the, he was the bombardier in the Lancaster bomber during the Second World War, and that he, could, he knew where the flak was going to hit, and so he told the guy, 
So they were doing this, and he was just saying, left a bit, left a bit, right, no, go there. I like that. Yeah, yeah. And you got me at Bombardier. Yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> um, and I got, I wrote that whole novel, but I, did, I didn't feel it was, I didn't feel it could go anywhere. I wanted it as a series, okay. and it wouldn't go anywhere. And I wrote several other things, and I wrote a fantasy novel I really like, and I sold six copies of that over three years. Um, and so I wrote the book that I wanted to write without having any idea, probably thinking there wasn't an audience for it. And also thinking it would might be popular in England, because it's lots of English people go to Spain on holiday. It might sell in Spain, and that was about it. And what I discovered is even before I, the sales began to take off significantly, 60, 70% of my sales are from the US. And that really, because why would the US read about Moorish Spain? And I, I'm not sure why, but they still do. Although there is a thing in the US that people are obsessed is the wrong word, but really interested in the old country. Yeah, but I, I, I interpret that as, yeah, so they're looking to Spain in that case, yeah. or Europe, or yeah. Ireland so, and England. Yeah, and yeah, and like you say, there's a very high proportion of Spanish-speaking people in America. So, with a, with a bit of accident in a way, you've discovered this quite small niche, and there's the old thing about show me the niches, I'll show you the yeah. riches, and that's yeah. obviously worked for you because mm -hmm. the more focused you are on one particular area, I guess the easier the targeting becomes. Yeah, yeah. So you, you pick, you pick, uh, well, uh, that's, right. that's, a, that's a good point actually, because you, most of your targeting is done by looking at similar authors to yourself. Yeah, and there are none, you know. So who am I targeting? So I'm looking, I'm even putting things like Lee Child down because I, my books are, have an element of thriller to them as well as mystery. And I'm putting other mystery writers down. And most of my similar writers are writing about English Tudor historical mysteries. C.J. Sansom, the yeah. Shard Lake books and, and various others. And for a long time, that's what I was doing. And it was kind of working. But then what I discovered is as I did adverts, people liked my Facebook page. And I started out with something like eight likes of the Facebook page, and I'm now up to 1,800. Once you get over 1,000 likes, you can take that, and this is one of Mark's big things, you can take it as a seed audience for a lookalike audience. Yeah. So I am now targeting my books to people who like the same things as the people who have bought my books. And the important thing is the lookalike audience is huge. Yeah, So you might exactly. have a thousand people, but it built an audience of a hundred thousand. I know, so my lookalike audience is 85 million in the States. Right, okay, there you go. So, you know, that's fantastic, yeah. but it's too many. Yeah. So you then hone it down by other at 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 attributes. And I like to have maybe 50, 60,000 pool to aim at. And that will, if things continue to go on as they have in the past, that pool will get larger and larger. Yeah. But at, at, at the outset, you don't want a huge number, you know. In some cases, I've targeted 5,000 people. Because 5,000 sales is significant yeah, to me, you know. Yeah. So <laughs> your um, sales still skewed towards America? Yeah, yeah, which is weird, still. But it's also great, because there's 300 million. <laughs> I know, there's more people out <laughs> there. And, and I've recently had a, a book translated into Spanish. Okay. Uh, which I thought would really take off in the States, and hasn't but it has in Mexico. Okay. It's, it, I, I was number one in Mexico a week after it came out. Wow. Uh, and because uh, I got an ad, was an ad. Five pounds a day in Mexico, six pence a click. Goes a long there, way, there is yeah. no There is no competition <laughs> for that kind of book in Mexico. So I thought it was great, yeah. And it's still What about in well. Spain? No, no. They're not interested in the old country. Then Actually, they're not. No, we because we now have a house in Spain, we have Spanish lessons, and our Spanish tutor says, oh, no, no, we don't want to talk about the Moors. Mm. A bit of nice architecture, but Spanish architecture is far nicer. So it's, it's a... They see it's it as almost, a kind of alien. Well, they, they repelled the Moorish invaders. It's like, you know, suppose um, Germany had invaded the UK yeah. back in, in the Second World yeah. War. Yeah. How would we, you know, we would not want to talk about that period of history as one of the things we really like. So it, it's popular amongst Brits who, who know Spain and I've just started a blog series about Beyond the Beaches. 
so it's talking about the places I set yes. my books. Yeah. Um, you know, get back away from the, the sand. And, and um, you know, if people have their interest peaked by this, I'd, you know, I'm sure you would as well thoroughly recommend that part of the world just for looking around at some of the older oh buildings my and goodness. castles and magnificent yeah, yeah. towns. Granada in particular is a Granada is wonderful. Beautiful yeah, town. yeah. It's like Malaga, proper Malaga, Spain, yes. proper yeah. Spain, and yeah. still the same history. There are some flesh pots around that part of the world as well. <laughs> some young British, German, and oh, Scandinavian. Yes. Oh uh, yes, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Holiday makers probably best avoided, but no. yeah. um, well, this is uh, really uh, quite inspiring. I think for uh, I don't know where you'd place yourself. Mid list. Mid list. Yeah. yeah, solid mid list. You know, it, it's it's yeah. Yeah, and yeah. that is an absolutely 100% bona fide good ambition for somebody to have. Exactly. You don't have to be Adam Croft yeah. or Mark yeah. Lawson or yeah. Yeah. Um, Rachel Abbott or, yeah. you know, um, yeah. it's great. It is. Do go, do go, go yeah. that way, but um, to yeah. get to where you are, and that would be frankly fantastic for me as well. Yeah. So it's a really inspiring yeah. thing for me to look at. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. To sum up your focus, you've got a, quite a small niche. Yeah. You went, in your case, kind of bypassed the list building yeah and went for yep. direct sales I've still only got 31 on my email list 31 31 not 31,000 31. 31 yeah I'm going to have to join that to make it at least 32 <laughs> thanks because, uh, there you go so the mailing list has not been it is not no. which Mark would say is a huge part of his he, he would do yeah and I can understand that it is it is the bit that you own yeah and I totally I'm totally on board with that but it's something I've only got those 31 because people have joined it from liking my Facebook page and there's a link on there to it and that's how it's gone on but it it's not something I've put a lot of effort into and I should but at the moment I don't want I don't need to how many books in the series now five five and you've got another one coming yeah I'm writing I'm halfway through the six and there's gonna be ten do at have, least ten do you have an advanced reader team no nope. I'm weird I, I, I have a developmental editor who has been with me for four of the five books She's really good, and I, I use her all the time. I don't have beta readers, I don't have an ARC team. Uh, I think if I don't think it's any good, I, I don't want to, I, I know what I want the book to be. Yeah. I'm very happy to do the changes my editor tells me. Beyond that, I know what I want to say. So the first anybody reads it other than me and Sarah is when it appears on Amazon. Okay. And I always do pre orders. And you write as David Penny? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So people can find your books? Easily, yeah. I'm number one on Google number for my one, name. Number one, David Penny, excellent. First page of Google. Yeah, you've got the advantage <laughs> over all the Robert Joneses. Yeah, I know. There's a lot of David Pennies, actually. It's weird. Oh, I thought, yeah. when I was growing up, I thought, oh, it's a really well, unusual. At least you're not Penny. I know, be, yeah, yeah. yeah. would be number one on Google then. I know. Um, yeah. Let's have a final word before I let you go, David. I should just say, by the way, if people heard some ringing, like yeah, Father was Christmas. Was it I, Father Christmas? I think it's the time for the rights management interviews to stop and be changed to the next uh, lot of rights management okay, interviews. Right. But anyway, that's what that bell was. It wasn't Santa Claus. Um, let's have a quick word about uh, Ally, because yeah. you're a keen member yeah. of the Alliance of Independent yeah, Authors, yeah. and you yeah. were on the stand this morning yes. um, talking the good talk. So just give us a little... Um, we've had uh, Orner on before, but yeah. a reminder of what Ally is and why people should uh, be a member. Yeah, Ally, it, it, it's a weird thing because it doesn't do anything other than it's a place for independent authors to gather. And it's, it's a website... They have, it's a closed website unless you're a member, but they have a, a website, selfpublishingadvice.org, which is free to anybody. So, and I was, until this February, I was technical manager of Ally. Um, and it takes up quite a lot of time, so I, I wanted to go and spend more time writing books, so I resigned from that post. Uh, but I'm st I still a really keen member of the organization which is why I'm hanging around the stand and helping out and doing whatever I can for it yeah. because Ally as well as what Mark did Ally is what helped me to be the writer I am it's, it's a safe environment because we have this closed fa Facebook group you know what Facebook's like you put a post up and everybody leaps on you and, yes. and beats you around the head never happens on Ally not in the SPF groups but oh, so. no We're but again they're closed groups, groups aren't they groups, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, the yeah. secret I and think there's a, a yeah. more secure area that's something that's a good description I think Ally is uh, whether you want to call it like a union um, yeah. or it's a little yeah, pressure yeah. group that represents yeah, yeah. the interest a of a pressure indie group and so it's pushing and it's always at the cutting edge of what indie authors are doing yeah. and because they have partner members you can get discounts you get discounts with Ingram Spark on your pod production 
So I save my membership fees two or three times over in the year from the discounts I get through yeah. just printing books, which is great, you know. Great. Fantastic, yeah, love it. Well, David. Thank you very much. Thank you very much Thanks indeed for joining us. I look forward to hearing you're doing 120,000 next So do I, yeah. At some point, if your wife listens to this podcast, is she aware that you've made this money? Because I know you're trying to hide it from her. She, I know, no, no. I did, she never watches the internet, so I'll tell her. Thank goodness. Yeah, yeah, so I'll true. tell her, um, no, I haven't done anything at all. Deep yeah. penny slush funders yeah. there. Good. No, no, she was my accountant in the business, so she knows everything. She knows everything. Yeah. <laughs> David, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think it's inspiration for uh, for all of us, but particularly people who are older have a, a, some time on their hands. I mean, it's, it, it sort of felt to me a shame that David went through what you went through and other authors went through, but many years ago, back in the 70s, I think he started getting all the rejection letters and then a disappointing experience when a book was published. You just think, well, if only the world is as it is now then, he perhaps would have had a much more happier, happier career. But nonetheless, it's happened to him at the right time. He couldn't be a happier person, I should say. I don't think he dwells on this stuff at all. And here he is now, not just supplementing a what we'll call a pensioner's income, but making good money, and uh, we were delighted. Yeah, it's right. I mean, to be able to take what was, I suppose, a hobby, um, that he, something that he really enjoyed doing, and then to um, be able to make good money out of that, uh, that's... It's one of the wonderful things about um, what um, is possible these days as a writer. People can take those passion projects that they might have been working on for ages and ages, and rather than, uh, as would have been the case before, waste your time potentially sending them to agents, sending them to publishers, and, and then waiting to get rejected, it's, it's almost just just put them up. You know, put yeah. them up there, do a good job. You know, you know, listen to the podcast. We've we've covered everything you need to know about getting your books up in good shape, and then learn how to advertise them. You know, it's advertising, it, you know, it's common sense. I sometimes surprise myself when people, um, you know, ask me, does advertising really work? Well, you know, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's been it's been the bedrock of many, many industries for, I don't know, 100 years, more than that probably. You know, since mm. ever, you know, ever since commerce has been a thing, people need to be educated about what they might like to, to spend their money on. Um, and we're no different as authors to, um, to, you know, to people selling motor cars or um, holidays it's, it's just advertising um, and one of the amazing things about the way that we can advertise is that um, you can make an immediate profit so it's not about sticking up billboards and um, spending 20 grand on a, a big billboard at a railway station and then maybe um, in time suspecting that your sales might have increased because of that we know almost immediately to the last cent whether sales uh, were generated by that particular ad so you know, David has completely, you know, involved himself in that. He's learned how to do it, and, and now he's he's benefit, benefiting from it. Yeah. And if you want to um, to read more about the course, uh, as we mentioned at the beginning, if you're listening to this in June 2018, you can go to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash ads for authors and uh, read all about the course that David and others have taken. Um, gosh, there's so much on it now. AMS ads, BookBub ads. Uh, YouTube ads, Pinterest for authors is being added uh, immediately after this launch, so in July. Copywriting. What, copywriting for advertising. What, what else did I miss? Images. Images, yes. And, and images. I think we probably missed something else, but anyway. Almost certainly. There's yeah. seven, seven or eight uh, uh, modules now, part of advertising for authors. It's a monster. It's a monster. And the same price it was in March 2017. Yep, Absolutely. Good. Okay. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. Um, I think that might be the last of the part. Oh, no, we've got one more interview that we recorded at, at London Book Fair. Uh, that's with, there's that noise again. Don't know what it is. I think it's that stupid WhatsApp. I hate WhatsApp. Everyone uses it for everything now, for selecting the cricket team, for organising stuff in the village, for bike rides and stuff. And it pollutes my mind. It's another beep I could do without. You're basically, you're turning into a curmudgeon live before our eyes. Quite happy to be. 51 going on 61. <laughs> hey, I did cycle 80 miles at 20 miles an hour yesterday. That's quite impressive. I'm really pleased with that. Uh, um, How are you feeling today? I Actually, fine. I had a little bit of gas in the tank at the end of it as well. And, uh, and it was a proper race with thousands of people in it. And I'd not been involved in one that size before. And one of the terrifying aspects of it, what one terrifying aspect is cycling in a group of 
of 40 people at 20 or faster than that, you know, the average speed is 20 miles an hour and things can go wrong quickly. And the other terrifying thing is seeing things that have gone wrong quickly. And we probably passed six people covered in blood being scooped into ambulances on the side of the road. And you're just pedaling along thinking, I really hope that's not me (laughs) in the next half a mile. (laughs) But it was a great experience just to um, underline the fact that um, I'm young at heart. Um, Good. Yes, I think Imogen Clark is our final interviewee that we picked up at uh, a London book fair. And... um, uh, yes, I've just got one final thing to say that we are going to be in New York in July. I'm going to push that a couple of times between now and then. It'll be lovely to see you. I think that's going to be Wednesday, the 11th of July. We're going to be in New York City, which is in New York State in the East Coast of America. And we'd be delighted to buy you a drink, uh, even at New York prices. So um, come and see us and I'll give you more details about where and when closer to the date. But if you want to put that date into your diary, the 11th of July in New York, we'd be delighted to see you then. And John and I are going to be traveling off and meeting a couple of people uh, in the days before that. And we should say we're there for Thriller Fest, right? We are there for Thriller, Thriller Fest, yes. So I'll be speaking three times, I think, um, two panels and, and uh, once on my own. So that'll be fun. And then I've got uh, a few days and then I'm going, I'm not sure how I'm getting there yet. Um, I'll be in Denver for um, RWA and I may be going via Los Angeles potentially. Um, or if that doesn't pan out, I'm thinking about going via Boston and maybe dropping me to see the lovely folk at BookBub. So um, yeah. we, we will see. But yeah, I'll be in both of those places for sure. Great. Okay. Good. We'll look forward to seeing you then if you can make it. Otherwise, we look forward to talking to you again next Friday. We'll have another special interview from the podcast. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you got some value and some inspiration from it. And we'll speak to you next week. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Self-Publishing Formula podcast. Visit us at selfpublishingformula.com for more information, show notes, and links on today's topics. You can also sign up for our free video series on using Facebook ads to grow your mailing list. If you've enjoyed the show, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. We'll see you next time.